it was one of the biggest blockbusters of all time. It put a multi-million dollar cast in the most dangerous drama they'd ever faced. It was exciting and nerve-wracking. It also ignited a competition between two screen superstars. Are you here to take me on or the fire? High-rise horror, hair-raising stunts, and a legendary producer's burning ambition. On Backstory, The Towering Inferno. Mike, she's rolling a lot of smoke. 81st floor, right? Right. Chief? This is Roberts, the architect. What do we got here, Cappy? Fire started, 81st floor, storage room. This is a bad one. Smoke is so thick, we can't tell how far it spread. What about your exhaust system? Well, it should have reversed automatically. It must have been a motor burnout or something. Sprinklers? They're not working on 81. Why not? I don't know. Released in 1974, The Towering Inferno marked a high point in the decade's hottest film genre, the disaster movie. Thanks to extraordinary effects, an all-star cast, and the frightening story of an out-of-control blaze in the world's tallest building. All right, go, man, go! One of the most difficult productions in Hollywood history, The Towering Inferno was ultimately the vision of a single man, producer and co-director Irwin Allen. He spots the fire down there. Well, they... He goes back into the bathroom, puts well, the wet towels on, probably. and then Robert Wagner comes running out of here. He really created the towering inferno. He had that vision. Action! By 1972, Irwin Allen was riding high as producer of the fourth top grossing film ever made, the all-star disaster tale, The Poseidon Adventure. The most exciting escape adventure of our time. For his movie follow-up, Allen turned to an even more ambitious project that traded terror of water for the fear of fire. In 1973, he and 20th Century Fox began bidding for a soon-to-be-published novel called The Tower. It was the chilling story of a blaze that starts during the dedication of the world's highest skyscraper. But after the success of the Poseidon adventure, every studio was scrambling to make its own disaster epic and Allen was furious when he was outbid for rights to the tower by Warner Brothers. Refusing to surrender, he raced into action weeks later when he read the outline for a near identical novel called The Glass Inferno. He optioned the book, rushed it into pre-production, and came up with a plan that made Hollywood history. Allen demanded a meeting between the heads of both Fox and Warner Brothers. Armed with elaborate storyboards, he announced that Fox was already in the lead and said it would be suicide to make two big budget movies with the same story. Instead, Allen suggested a single film, which he would personally produce. Impressed by Allen's pitch and his reputation as Hollywood's master of disaster, Warners and Fox agreed to the first studio co-production, The Towering Inferno. This is it, this is the big one. This is The Towering Inferno. This is the picture, ladies and gentlemen, that we here at 20th Century Fox believe will be the biggest grocer of next year. Bigger, we think, and hope, even than the Poseidon Adventure. The film's budget was set for a pricey $11 million, with costs and profits to be split evenly between the studios. Allen hired Oscar winner Sterling Siliphant, co-writer of the Poseidon Adventure, to combine the Tower and the Glass Inferno into a single script. He then outlined the production with over 2,500 storyboards. All projects start with doing a visualization of an idea. How is it gonna look on the screen? These remarkable artists translate two pictures, that which the writer has put into words. Starting a picture starts with a picture. Say, that was rather clever. We would do diagrams of like a bird's eye on a sound stage with all the hoses, all the fans, all the fire stuff. And it was horrifying to the production people doing budgets when they realized what it was going to take. Hal, how's the money situation? A million one hundred and ten thousand dollars for miniatures only? Right. 
It's only money. In true Irwin Allen fashion, the producer hired the biggest stars that money could buy. Its ranks included William Holden as the builder of the world's tallest skyscraper, Fred Astaire as a charismatic con man, Jennifer Jones as a wealthy widow, Richard Chamberlain as Holden's unscrupulous son-in-law, Susan Blakely as Chamberlain's loyal wife, O.J. Simpson as head of security, and Robert Wagner as an adulterous PR man. Irwin Allen had the marvelous uh, way of being able to cast all those people in it. I mean, what a cast he got. Allen scored his biggest casting coup when he hired not one, but two of the industry's most in-demand superstars. Paul Newman and Steve McQueen. Their price was $1 million each, plus a percentage of the gross. McQueen was hired first and offered the lead role of San Francisco architect Doug Roberts. But the actor shocked Allen by choosing instead to play the supporting part of Fire Chief Michael O'Halloran. McQueen was convinced that O'Halloran would be a showier role. And since 1956, when he had a bit part in the Paul Newman film, Somebody Up There Likes Me, McQueen was determined to surpass his rival, so the role of the architect went to Paul Newman. McQueen also demanded just as many lines of dialogue as his co-star, so writer Sterling Siliphant was pulled back from a vacation in the Bahamas to add precisely 12 sentences to the actor's part. Providing a different kind of incendiary excitement was Faye Dunaway, cast as Newman's lover. What the part lacked in depth, Dunaway made up for in sex appeal and glamour. You don't talk at all? No. It's my lunch hour. Mm. Well, I'm not a cheeseburger, you know. <laughs> You're better. All protein, no bread. All I need to go with you is about eight glasses of water. I did a dress for Bay Dunaway, the plunging neckline that went all the way down to the navel. Time magazine said, that dress created more suspense in the picture because they wondered when she was going to fall out of the damn thing. British filmmaker John Gillerman would handle most of the directing chores, staging all dialogue scenes between the actors. Right action. I want to see all your floor plans, 81 through 85. Gotcha. OK, let's try again. But it was Irwin Allen himself who would direct the movie's action unit. Let's go to the next camera, Joe. All right, now where's the man? With a cast of over 3,000 and real fire on the set, Irwin Allen knew that the slightest mistake could lead to injury or death. If anything happens to me, Allie gets my pickup truck. But before long, the production would spark another kind of firestorm, as Irwin Allen faced both on-camera bonfires and battles among the film's demanding superstars. When Backstory returns, an all-star cast fights fire and flood. All right, Susan. Action. He turned away. He's at the door. He looks back. He smiles. He runs. Man on fire. Oh, From the earliest days of its filming in May of 1974, The Towering Inferno was already a film for Hollywood's record books. Shot by four separate units, it required 57 sets, the most ever used until then for a 20th Century Fox production. We shot San Francisco, the stages at Fox, uh, the miniatures, miniatures so-called was six, seven stories above the ground. So it was pretty awesome. We worked very closely with the LA and the San Francisco Fire Department. First thing that comes to you, well, how are we gonna keep from setting off the sprinklers in the sound stage? And so at the meeting I said, well, that's easy, we'll just turn the valve off. Fire Department says, uh, shutting off the sprinkler system with the express intent of setting a fire is called arson. So we had a fireman with a thermometer and when it would get to be 145, that he would shut the company down. I've never worked with anyone that has been more prepared 
than Irwin was. And action! I had that big sequence to do when I had to dip down and get ignited by the fire. He knew exactly what was going to happen. Maybe that's why I ran through the fire. 